Hello, good morning. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started, even though I know people will be trickling in over the next few minutes. My name is Sherry Bush, and I am co-chair of the Environment Work Group with Sid Washington, along with my fellow co-chair, Charlotte Mosier, who's sitting up here at the front. Um, we would like to welcome you today to our session on the struggle for land and resource rights. It's a topic of critical importance and one that certainly cuts across all sectors. So we're very pleased to have this panel to discuss the topic here today at SID's annual conference. As you may know, SID Washington has 22 work groups um, that cover different topics and different regions. Throughout the year, each work group will organize around four to six different events that highlight the latest thinking, best practices, current trends, and new challenges in our respective areas. Work groups are a great way for you to engage with other SID members and to also help influence SID's programming for the year. So I would encourage you all to participate in the working groups. If you are not a member of the Environment Work working group and would like to be, please contact either me or Charlotte, and you can get information off of the SID Washington website. There's also a work group table at the conference today just outside of the main meeting room. This year's annual conference has been organized around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, were, which were drafted in 2012. The Millennium Development Goals will expire in 2015, and a new global agenda <coughs> will be implemented, which will include concrete steps to eradicate extreme poverty from the face of the earth by 2030 and deliver on the promise of sustainable development. It is within this context that Sid Washington has organized today's breakout sessions to address specific post-2015 SDGs, including the topic of our session today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's session, Mr. Mark Cassidy. Uh, Mark is the Global Governance Director at PACT. He has over 20 years of international development experience with a specialization in governance programming. Prior to joining PACT, he served as senior manager for democracy and governance programs at International Resources Group, director of the International Rescue Committee's Governance and Rights Technical Unit, and chief of party on four separate USAID democracy and governance projects in East Africa, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East and most recently as COP for the USAID-funded Mekong Partnership for the Environment Project based out of Bangkok. In the US, he has served as a member and chairman of his hometown's land use planning board, comprehensive planning, and zoning review committees. He holds two master's degrees in regional planning and Latin American studies from the State University of New York at Albany. So without further ado, I shall pass the baton to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Can you all hear me? Okay, today's discussion is on the struggle for land and resource rights. Um, as the ever-increasing competition over land, water, and other natural resources heightens the risk of violent conflict around the world, land and resource rights security is becoming a higher priority for development agencies than in the past. What are the main drivers of land conflict today at the sub-regional, sub national, and, and local jurisdictional and landscape levels? That's the essentially the broad overview of the topic today. However, um, Sherry has assembled a panel of, of people who have a really a deep expertise in land and resource rights and, and come at it from different perspectives. Um, to my right is uh, Dr. Michael Roth. Uh, he is currently Senior Associate and Director of Land Tenure and Property Rights uh, at Tetratech. Uh, he, uh, he obtained his PhD in agricultural economics in 1986 from Purdue University and spent 18 years at the University of Washington's Land Tenure Center before joining Tetratech in 2005. He has researched and implemented programs on land tenure formalization, agrarian structure, land reform, market development, and agricultural performance in over 25 countries spanning Africa, Latin America, and Asia. For those of who know this business, uh, Mike has organized numerous 
conferences and training events and is widely known for his work on land policy, market development, and, and tenure security. Uh, to his right, is Solange Bandiati Baji. I hope I did okay there. Solange is the Africa Program Director for the Rights and Resources Initiative. She leads the development of RRI's strategy for engagement in Africa with focus on tenure rights, building more synergies around new strategic analysis and giving actors a more strategic understanding of trends, issues, and options and gender in Africa. She has a PhD in Women and Gender Studies from Clark University in Massachusetts and a master's degree in environmental sciences and in philosophy from Sheikh Anta Diop University in, in Senegal. Um, she's worked with the UN and published work on gender in relation to natural resources management. Uh, Tiernan Menon uh, will be our last <coughs> presenter. Uh, he is the Director of Land and Resource Rights um, Practice at Comonix. Tiernan uh, is a lawyer and a land rights specialist with 15 years of international development experience. He is currently uh, director of the Columbia Human Rights Project and Land and Resource Rights Practice at, at Comonix, and as well senior advisor at uh, the Rwanda Land Project and Tajikistan Land Reform and Farm Restructuring Project. So at Comonix, you're in charge of three different programs at the same time. Um, he's directed legal empowerment programs at the Open Society Foundation, researched customary land tenure in South Sudan, and led a justice sector strengthening project in Bolivia. Oh. Um, he's published on land reform, indigenous land rights, and customary justice systems. He's a lawyer from Cornell, and he's done his uh, master's in international development and economics at SAIS. So as you see here, we have, um, we have an agricultural economist, a gender and natural resources specialist, and a, uh, a, a lawyer and human rights specialist with us. So we're very, very lucky to have this different group of, of, of specialists who have all focused on land and uh, the rights of, of, of people to those resources on, on, on land and, and on sea and elsewhere. Um, because this conversation could go in so many different directions, I've, I've asked the um, discussants to focus on, on an open door policy. <laughs> 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 um, welcome. So because we could talk about land and resource rights uh, in 10 different ways. I thought the purpose, conflict will be part of the, 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 of the focus, but also conflict often uh, focuses around the poor and vulnerable and, and how they are marginalized and, and, and left off the agenda of the, sometimes of development agencies, sometimes of their very own governments. So what will happen is they'll give a five to 10 minute uh, brief talk, <coughs> and, and then uh, I will follow up with one question for each of them, and then after that, I, I will open it up for uh, questions, and please make them questions. They'll, they'll, there should be 30 to 30, 30 to 40 minutes for questions, so it's, it's not that we'll be talking at you the whole time. So with your, um, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to Mike. Uh, thank you. I'm going to give a bit of an overview on the, the struggle for land and resource rights. This is not a new issue. In fact, if you look at the immediate post-World War II era of land to the tiller programs in Southeast Asia, massive investments were made. That was followed by massive investments in land and agrarian reform in Latin America. About the time I joined the University of Wisconsin at the Land Tenure Center, issues of farm restructuring in the former Soviet Union, of returning people, uh, land and assets that were held by collectives and cooperatives. About the same time, the massive food shortages in, in uh, Africa led to a focus on broadening access to resources and securing rights in those resources to uh, address basic issues of food vulnerability and food security. As one went on up to the more recent times, there was an increasing emphasis on land rights and biodiversity protection, taking into account the loss of uh, forests and habitat worldwide. On into the present day where USAID is increasingly focused on the nexus between land tenure and resource rights and food security. 
land tenure and resource rights and climate change, land tenure and resource rights and conflict. There's uh, definitely an evolution there uh, and it spans many decades of history, but it also uh, just underscores the very fundamental point that land and resources are important in the livelihoods of everyone. They're important for uh, asset ownership. They're important for securing the livelihoods of people, not only in their immediate generation, but also the ability to transfer their assets to their children and on into the future. What is land tenure? Well, land tenure can kind of be broken down into three or four elements. One of them is simply uh, holding uh, clearly rights, but holding enough rights that are of value. For instance, not having a right to transact land and property isn't useful, for instance, for collateral. Having assets or having land that are of sufficiently long duration to recoup the returns on investment having rights long enough to invest in a dairy parlor, plant a horticulture uh, orchard, dig wells, etc., is important for adding value to that land. Having assurance that th those rights are yours or indeed yours and can be, be protected against um, uh, others intruding upon those rights. These are all dimensions of land tenure and resource rights. But in the last decade, perhaps 15 years, there's new dimensions that have been added, and that is the importance of communication, having people know their rights, rather than just having rights in law. People know what rights are theirs and how they can be executed and how they can be enforced. Governance, that land rights systems ought to be accountable, that they ought to be transparent, and that they ought to be decentralized to the lowest levels of, of governance making. All of these are important elements that I hopefully my colleagues will elaborate upon in their presentations. I would, however, just like to draw attention to a new world, uh, if there is one, uh, in land tenure and resource rights, and that is the nexus with conflict. For anybody who has worked in this field in the last five years, one has seen a noticeable shift in programming within USAID. Now, if you think of land tenure and property rights as being those, well, those cornerstones of a, of a land system, conflict is the opposite. As land tenure and property rights systems are enabling, conflict is disabling. As land tenure and property rights systems are creating, conflict is destroying. And one sees this tension unfold around the world and in many different ways. And one sees land tenure and property rights interventions both as an effort to stem conflict, prevent conflict, but also an intervention in the wake of conflict. So let me give you some examples uh, in uh, East Timor following the uh, wars in the uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s. USAID made a substantial investment in using uh, basic systems of restoring rule of law in land, communications, uh, dispute resolution as a way to put people back on their land again and to give them rights. And what that program discovered is that having an intervention like land tenure and resource management be a tool for improved governance help to uh, control uh, the, the, the conflict that was occurring within communities. Or go to Afghanistan where interventions there in the wake of conflict were used to resettle people uh, in, um, in urban surroundings, but also to upgrade informal habitats into something where assets were improved. Or think about Colombia in the wake of the Havana peace talks today where USAID is investing in programs to restitute people's rights on land, to formal formalize those rights, and to provide them with real development. Why is the latter important? Well, lots of money is wasted around the world in land programs to give people's rights where they still subsist in poverty. 
because people lack the basic means of production and the livelihoods to bring value to their land and resources. So increasingly, it's no, matter, it's no longer just a matter of giving people more secure rights to their land and their assets, but giving them the means to add value to those assets. Just a final example, uh, Ethiopia, or two final examples, Ethiopia where USAID is now investing in a policy framework and a legal framework that will help resolve conflict in pastoral areas. In the last 10 years, USAID has done little work in those zones, where it used to be the mainstay of their work in West Africa about the time I began work in the early 70s. Now USAID is working on conflict management and conflict protection around water points, irrigation, waterways, et cetera, in Ethiopia. In South, uh, South Sudan, USAID is using land use planning and participatory land use planning in particular to have communities work with government on developing plans for their land and resources. Unfortunately, that came to an end in December. The last thing I'll say before passing on, that's just the big overview, is that the world is just a lot smaller than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The investment flows that are taking place around the world today are creating huge demand and opportunities for the expansion of pipelines, infrastructure in Africa. Go to any African city and see the amount of construction that is taking place today. These are raising the, uh, the potential for conflict in peri-urban areas of Africa but also over the communal lands through which electrical lines and gas lines now must run. Uh, that investment is also seen in the amount of large scale investment in agriculture, but hopefully we can have a debate a little bit uh, later on about whether that's a good thing, a bad thing, how it can be regulated and so forth. So that's the big 10 minute picture of where USAID's been, I think, in the last 60 years. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Sloan? Okay, good morning everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to focus my talking points on Africa and also like the driving forces that really uh, shape the struggle for land and resource rights. So basically I would like to focus on the way the land and resources are governed and also the perceptions and ideology about the local and also the legalized or legitimized forms of exclusion. And when I talk about the way of governing, I think it's important to see how the government really see the resources and how they see uh, the people. And basically what we are seeing over in Africa is that most of the government, they know where the resources are, but generally they don't know where the people are. And the reason why I'm saying that, if you ask them about the land, the land availability, they will say, okay, most of the lands are vacant. So they are ready for investors to come in and take those land because nobody is using their land. And you go and talk to the local communities, they think they are the legitimate owners of this land and of these resources. So they can't really process how can somebody <laughs> come from outside and take those resources. So you could see here the clashes that just start by two different worlds where people think these are like, we are the legitimate owners and where the government think, okay, legally, we are, I'm the owner and I can give away those land that I think are really uh, vacant. So that also something that create conflict at the local level and also the vulnerable and poor people that Mark talked about uh, at the beginning. And if you look at the large scale land acquisitions in Africa right now, uh, one of the World Bank uh, study that was done in 2006, uh, like uh, was done recently, showed that since 2006, like Africa alone, 50 million hectares have been already secured or being negotiated by foreign investors. So that really shows uh, that this is really a big deal. So now why the governments are really choosing this path because they're thinking, okay, they want to be, to have economic growth and they want also to be like the BRICS country, like Brazil, China, Russia, India. Mm -hmm. And how can they do that is to attract more investors. But is that the right way to go? Is it the way to really elevate poverty? Mm -hmm. Is it really something that will help the locals really emerge? Mm 
that's also a question that we need to start thinking about. And if you look at some specific countries like uh, the DRC, uh, people will say that the conflict is rising because of the demand for coltan, tin, and other minerals that people use in laptops, mm -hmm. in cell phones, and also electronic devices. Again, the demand from the market is really also driving the conflict at the local level. And another aspect that is important to keep in mind is the insertion of state politics into localized dispute. Mm -hmm. And for the state, for example, to have the right of inclusion or exclusion based on political identity. Here, um, we'll talk about the case of Ivory Coast, and they have been into conflict. And if you look at the origin of the conflict, is that they talk about those, the so-called Ivorian, and those who are not Ivorian. But if you look at the political context, most of the farmers and most of uh, the local investors are from the neighboring country, but they have lived in Ivory Coast for decades, and they consider themselves as Ivorian. But when the state come and define who is who and define the political identity, that also can uh, like uh, create conflict. And right now, most of the African countries also are going through uh, land reform. And the reason why they're going through land reform is because they want to move away from uh, some kind of colonial legacy because uh, most of the land, for example, if you take Senegal, the land law that is uh, in effect is from 1964. In Cameroon, they're reviewing their land law, but it's the law from 1974. Liberia is going through land reform and almost done. And if you look at the Central African Republic where there is conflict right now, the land law that is still effective is from the colonial period from 1899. So you will imagine that while the context is uh, like moving, evolving, those land reform that was set during the colonial period are still in effect, and they really don't uh, merge or they don't really fit within the current economic context or political context. That also contribute to creating uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. Another aspect that I would like to bring in here is the specific impacts of uh, land conflict or how women are affected by uh, land allocation or resource allocation. And here, like, uh, this is not new, but many uh, organizations like ILC have done work on that. So basically, they're finding that women, they face like, uh, discrimination when it comes to access, control, or ownership over land, and also, if you look at women's social, cultural, and political relations, that and the way they, in, they involve in decision making regarding resources and land allocation, there is a discrimination out there. And also women have relative uh, cash income, poverty vis-a-vis -vis men. That also like, shape the way they have access or control over land and how they can invest over the land. And most of the women in Africa, for example, like the FAO like research will say that more than 70% of women are involved in agriculture, in food stapling, but only 2% have ownership of land. So that mm -hmm. also is something that we need to keep in mind. And uh, why is it important to look for decentralized uh, system of land management? Because I believe that conflict can, could be avoided by allowing local communities to set the terms of land use and sell. And that way, you can, they can have decision-making power and bargain with the companies and say, these are the terms that we want you to, lo to use our land, and not the government, for example, setting mm -hmm. how uh, like, uh, companies should be dealing with the communities. And, uh, and I believe also that legal reform can resolve and preempt a variety of land tension. For example, like I said, many African countries are going through reform because they know that the best way to attract investors is to show them that, look, all the land saying system are clear, it's clarified, so when you invest, you won't f like face some kind of protest or conflict that could jeopardize your investment. And that's why they're going through uh, land reform uh, right now. But also, how are they going through land reform? What are the models that they are using? Most of the African countries right now are talking about individual land titling. But if you look at the rural area, it's more customary tenure system and collective tenure rights that they are used to. 
But when you start talking about individual land titling, for uh, somebody from a local, uh, from the rural area, it could be very pricey. And also the way they relate to the land is from a collective uh, perspective. So that could also contribute to creating conflict where people don't see the land as individual but also but as a collective. And the other aspect is that, okay, for example, if you look at um, East Africa, like Mozambique and Tanzania, like the government has tried to decentralize decision making for land since the 1990s, like allowing communities to negotiate the sale and nearby land. So what happened is that the government is uh, seeing that you know, the local are really gaining, they're gaining from uh, that uh, uh, ownership and they're gaining from being the one to make the decision making. So now, what we're seeing is that when the value of the resources start to rise, the government also have less incentive to let the benefit go to the communities because they say, look, this is something also that I can grab. So these are some points that I just wanted to throw and I'm sure with more questions and during the discussion, there's more to talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Solange. Tiernan? Yeah, I'll, I'll build on that um, by expanding it from Africa to the rest of the world because I think there's actually a lot of similar issues uh, parallel dynamics, um, and you've seen conflict currently in, in, in Indonesia and in Papua, um, um, in, in Guatemala and the Andes, um, you know, in Mindanao and the Philippines, really all over the place, where it's really about um, this dynamic, this uh, discourse between local communities, local community ownership of land and control of resources, and uh, government or state or, or some other, uh, perhaps a neighboring community or another tribe, uh, their claims to that land. Um, and so it's really created a whole a massive amount of uncertainty um, from country to country. Um, and at that basis is, is, is land and resource rights. Um, so it's a driver for conflict. It's an issue that has to be addressed in post-conflict situations. And really, I think the development community is looking more and more as, as, as being a little more proactive at land and, and, and you know, kind of fending it off before it ever even becomes a conflict issue. Um, but there's also a lot of links to development, so I just want to touch on that on, on that briefly because while this topic is is focused, uh, this headline is focused on land and resource rights and conflict, um, there are broader implications for development. Um, I think if we could, it'd be nice to take down this wall and talk to the the future people next door um, about land. Kind of combine our two sessions because I think it's it's a critical aspect of that agenda um, as well. But you can also look at the implications of land and local land and resource governance for democracy as well, for, for, for good governance, mm -hmm. for economic development, uh, access to collateral. There's a lot of permutations of the land issue um, that, that come into play. Um, but what's interesting about this is that, is that land, despite all this kind of cross-sectoral, cross-cutting issues, land is not really its own sector. It's been cross-cutted so much that it's uh, mm -hmm. kind of doesn't really have a sector and there's not hasn't been a core group of people that, that or, or institutions uh, that work on land and look at the specific dynamics of it. Um, until, I think, somewhat more recently, it's, it's increased a lot on the agenda. Mike has been doing a lot of work at Tetra Tech on this for some years. Um, I think RRI and Kamonix are, are also working on this much more now than, than in the past. Um, but at the same time, land is also, uh, requires a lot of different technical uh, expertise, um, you know, requires law, requires GIS, technical specialists. It, it, it really requires a lot of people in the room, requires policy specialists um, to look at this issue a little more intensively, um, come to some kind of critical consensus, some idea about how to improve land and resource rights, access and governance. Um, and I think we're getting to that point, but um, but it's, it's, I mean, you mentioned is being part of the SDG, I think, Sherry, but it's, it's actually not its own part. There's, I think, two indicators in the draft SDGs that are in different parts. Uh, there's not kind of one core area that addresses land. So even that's cross-cutted um, around the SDGs. Um, so, so, but conflict is oftentimes, I think, a lens uh, by which land is addressed. Um, a lot of our project, a lot of the work we're doing is either post-conflict uh, scenarios uh, or it's in, in conflict-affected countries. Um, and there's kind of a couple of different drivers, I think, that are important to just to, to mention. Um, and, and kind of one of the, the most high pri profile one, which is perhaps why some of you are here, is to talk about land grabbing. Um, it's really become a, a big issue on the agenda um, internationally. Um, and so what are the dynamics that create land grabbing? Um, Mike and Solange touched on that a bit. Um, 
going back to, to colonial era legal, uh, colonial era laws and colonial era, era jurisprudence that actually kind of uh, set ownership for land in the colonial powers and then also that was transferred to state governments. Mm -hmm. So what you have in so many countries is a scenario where state claims they own the land um, or the resources underneath, mm -hmm. but then you go there and the community claims they own the land and the resources underneath. Mm -hmm. And so then when a big investor comes in and they go to you know, the ministry and they say, well, we'd like to do a great agricultural you know, rice scheme production in your country, it's gonna increase jobs, it's gonna mm -hmm. uh, bring a lot of investment, it's gonna feed the future. Um, the government says, well, here's a big, massive, you know, 500 acre plot where you can go, there's no one there, our records show that it's, it's, it's empty, it's perfect for investment. You know, great, great soil, great water access, here you go. And then they start, they, they go and try to start their rice scheme, rice investment, and the community says, we weren't consulted about this. This is our land, this has been our land forever, uh, but they don't have any title that they can show for it. So then the question becomes, well, who's, you know, who's to blame? Who's at fault for this? And then how do you rectify it? Um, so I think that's, that's one of the major issues that, we're, that we're, I think we struggle with. Um, but this also extends, I think, you know, to resources as well, to mining and oil. Um, you know, and you've been seeing it a lot more in terms of agricultural concessions because of the glowing de growing demand um, for biofuels, for palm oil, for rubber, et cetera. And so more and more the kind of principles that governments will use for mining concessions um, well, they will apply to also agricultural concessions and it's created massive amount of conflict. Um, so that's, that's kind of one major issue. Um, just briefly on, on post-conflict, as Mike mentioned, we, we do, I think there's also, it's, it's recognized as an underlying continuing tension in a lot of post-conflict societies or conflict-affected societies such as South Sudan, Colombia, East Timor, um, and how to effectively restitute and provide access again to land um, is, is, is a constant uh, issue. Um, I mean, I saw in South Sudan examples of, of good efforts to try and give title to people by way of title, uh, formalizing ownership, individual ownership over customary land. But what happened is that a lot of that reform that was, hap that was going on in towns and villages um, was actually depriving people, vulnerable populations, returning refugees of their land, uh, widows from the war. Um, their land was taken from them because the structure that was set up did not have proper checks and balances and dispute resolution mechanisms for vulnerable populations. So uh, ministers or wealthy elites could come in and claim that this was their land and pay off the surveyors um, and get title. Um, so that's something that you really have to look at um, constantly with land, is what are the vulnerabilities, who are the vulnerable populations, and design programs to make sure you address their issues. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, so as I listened to each presentation, I, I realized that there was a, actually a common theme that was, um, that was presented from different angles. Um, governments uh, have the natural desire for foreign direct investment. That's logical. They want to drive growth, create jobs, create wealth. The private sector um, uh, wants to uh, have, a, it must have a return on investment in order to be uh, legitimate and successful in its, in its backers' eyes. And communities, of course, uh, are the people who live and, and have lived in, in these, in these uh, research-rich areas for, for millennia. Um, I think it would be good if the panel could talk a little bit more about this, this uh, how globalization in, in, in particular has driven um, uh, growth and, and how conflict has, um, has emerged in, in, in new ways and what, if anything, has the development community been able to do to mitigate some of this conflict? I mean, you did touch on this a bit, but maybe, Mike, you could talk ab about from an economic point of view and uh, the private sector uh, can do to, um, to play a more positive role or what they are doing, if you have examples of that. Um, and then, Solange, I I'll ask you to maybe talk a bit from um, a community and gender point of view and then Tiernan from a, a legal point of view. Um, what are you seeing, what trends are you seeing, uh, wh what are the challenges that are being faced and, and, and uh, what can the development community do and not do? Is that fair? Sure. Okay. Well, there's probably not a day that goes by or maybe I should say a week that goes by that there isn't some company tapping on the door of USAID saying, can you please help us to facilitate an investment somewhere in the world? There's 
situation after situation where you have indigenous communities that say we need improved livelihoods. Mm -hmm. We want to give our kids a better life. We want to bring value to our land resources. And there's not a place in the world where there's not a weak government that is unable to provide the basic authority, um, jurisdictional authority to, to enforce a contract that is credible in the eyes of the community or an investor. That fundamental uh, dynamic has played itself out and really come to the fore in the last uh, four or five years. Um, enough so that uh, the FAO led the charge on developing the voluntary guidelines on responsible investment to help find a pathway to bring about a better governance structure that could govern investors, govern governments, and communities. But it's, a, it's been an uphill challenge, and perhaps we'll talk more about that. Mm -hmm. But it's still new and in the making. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing that I've seen in the last two or three years is the extent to which bilateral and multilateral agencies have committed themselves to an improved land governance framework worldwide. Mm -hmm. Now, you can say, well, that's talk. It still is at the early stages, and we'll see where it goes. But look at the amount of financial commitments by BIFID to its countries around the world. Look at what the World Bank is doing in the way of committing to a, a new land governance framework. Look at what EU is doing. I spoke about uh, USAID so far. The donors have, uh, have lined up to lend that support, but one has to question, who is the ultimate authority to give security to land tenure? Who is the ultimate uh, authority to give security to contracts? Who is the ultimate authority to give guidance to policy and legal frameworks? And ultimately you come back to problems of states and states are weakened by conflict. Um, states in some cases create conflicts. So as, a, as a, a set of development thinkers in this room, this, this mix of issues that we saw decades ago continues to evolve and permutate in the uh, new ways that we're all struggling with. Okay, thanks, Mike. And so, Lawrence, if I could just ask you to focus a bit on, there's a big push for decentralization, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it makes a lot of sense oftentimes, but, but its impact on, on, on women and, and vulnerable populations, could you speak to that experience? Yes, uh, I think what we've seen right now is uh, <coughs> the local dynamic has changed. What we mm -hmm. used to call customary, traditional, is no longer that you know backward thing because you go to a community, you see that people are educated, women mm -hmm. are accepting mm -hmm. for uh, their, li uh, their rights. You mm -hmm. see that also what we used to call the so-called customary chiefs, they are very well educated people and are mm -hmm. in position of power. For example, you go to Cameroon, most of the traditional chiefs mm -hmm. are member of the government, member of the parliament, and also they're member of the legal uh, system. Mm -hmm. So you will see that those people really know what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So when they go back to their community, they can talk about the economic development, they can talk about globalization, they talk, can talk about how the world is evolving, and they could see what could be good for their communities. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing also a pushback from communities who are no longer passive because they say, we know our rights and we know what we want around our resources. Mm -hmm. You go, for example, to Liberia, you will see that local communities are organizing to really challenge the private companies and saying, mm -hmm. now, if you want to do something with our land, you need to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And the companies are realizing that there is a need to really engage uh, with the local communities, with uh, women's network. And they're doing that, so that's a positive thing that they should be really uh, putting forward and moving uh, towards that too. And also the government, also they realize that they need to be open. Mm -hmm. And right now, with all these countries going through reform, there are multi-stakeholder dialogues going on, mm -hmm. where it's no longer the government deciding what, how to use the resources, but bringing people and say, okay, how do we make sure that everyone's interests are taken into account, everyone's needs are taken into account, like indigenous people, mm -hmm. women, the minorities, and even like the civil society. Mm -hmm. Because, be, uh, but before it was really hard to see that, but it's happening right now. And I think these are the trends that we need to keep in mind and see, okay, there is space for dialogue. And once we install dialogue, 
we can really make sure that the way the resources are governed will really like meet the needs and interests of uh, all the stakeholders. That's very interesting, Solange. I'll just interject a mi minute before I pass it to Tiernan. Uh, when I was uh, recently in, um, in Bangkok, I was working on the Mekong Partnership for the Environment. This very same scenario was playing itself out in the Mekong uh, relating to large-scale uh, infrastructure projects that are being developed on the Mekong and its tributaries. And the big conflict really is uh, what role does the state have to push back against <coughs> private sector investment and what role does civil society actually have to be effective in convincing uh, private sector and government <coughs> to do responsible investment? In, in other words, consult them first, uh, uh, full and prior consent is one, one, one of the aspects. But more importantly, just understand that it's in their best interest, in the best interest of the private sector, in the, in the medium to long run, to actually have robust citizen input into the process, into the development plans before they actually uh, break ground. It's too, still too early to tell whether or not the Mekong will result in, in uh, an environmental and, and social disaster or not. Uh, the, the, the rate of uh, hydropower plants and the rate of uh, other large-scale development is fast and furious. But there are some signs that um, governments from Vietnam all the way up to China are, 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 are seeing that, and private sector companies are seeing that there is, maybe this does make some sense. And the way to do it is still being figured out, but that's enough. Tiernan, Tier sorry to hog your time there. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, so I guess from the legal point, mm -hmm. particularly in relation to business interests in the world, mm -hmm. um, I mean, oftentimes there's, there's, there's not a clarity of what laws really mean. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, laws are out, out, out of date. So if a business mm -hmm. goes into a community, goes into a country, and they want to you know, apply, they want to follow the law, mm -hmm. do their investment according to the law, they look at the law and they ask the government, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. And everyone tells them, well, this is what the law says. But the law, the law is from a colonial era. <laughs> it's out of date, even if it's been passed 10 years ago, but it doesn't recognize customary law, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't recognize customary tenure, doesn't recognize indigenous tenure. Um, then it's it, what, what does the business do? Yeah. They're in a they're in a legal limbo. Yeah. Um, even if there is a relatively good law, a whole other question is its enforcement. You know, at the local level, um, even if the law recognizes customary tenure or indigenous rights, is that being enforced by local land administration or local communities um, or, or you know decentralized uh, authorities? Um, so I, you know, it's 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 I think that's that's the scenario that that businesses are are put in. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have, uh, we do actually have a half an hour, uh, almost a half an hour, um, to open it up to discussion. And um, I, I only ask uh, that you say your name and your organization and do ask a question or make a statement. Uh, but before we go there, can I just give a round of applause to my colleagues here? <laughs> and, and to Sherry for organizing. Tom in the back, and then oh, I'm sorry, you so the three of you. So we'll take three questions at once. Tom, you're first. Um, my name is Tom Bridal. I am the co-chair of the, one of the work groups, the governance work group, and, and uh, the work group I work on is governance, and so I wanted to ask a question around the governance issue, in particular around the role of government agents and the increasing recognition, the idea that the, the issues are not just issues of capacity development, but also issues around the incentives of those agencies, how those agencies are held accountable, um, and the reality that in a lot of cases, particularly I think at the lo in some ways at the local smaller level, that there are bad actors in this process. There is corruption. There are real serious problems, and um, I've seen it around land tenure issues where you have a local uh, cadastral function and the people who run that cadastral function, you know, do seem to be changing the lines and the borders in, in relation to how money is coming in and their own sort of personal interests. Um, and I was struck today that, that, that it really came out of the box from uh, the administrator and from others that these governance issues are the big challenges, particularly in this post-toxic I wonder if you could talk about the government agencies. How do you hold a government agency accountable for making decisions that are equitable, 
decisions that are in the interest of their constituents and not just in the interest of the agency or the staff or whatever. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, Susan Ward Navon. I um, am an independent consultant. I work with a lot of um, community-based organizations in Asia, especially Southeast Asia, on a variety of free association, assembly, expression issues, and land rights figures very prominently into these issues. It's a nice segue into the question that was asked before. I'm interested in the judiciary because you can have the best laws in the world, and if they're not enforced or they're, they're not implemented, um, many of these countries um, the corruption goes along with weak rule of law um, and weakened judiciaries which are often beholden to the executive um, which controls everything. I'm thinking of Cambodia as an example, but there are many others, um, including Africa and Tin, and um, spoke to a little bit of this globally, but I'd really like to see how donor governments can strengthen judiciaries and strengthen sort of the rule of law overall in addressing some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Carol Lujo from the Cloudburst Group, and I'm going to try to tie those two comments together and throw in uh, another element. Um, so thinking about the governance question and thinking about some of this morning's comments, I'd be curious to hear what the panel thinks are some interesting examples of potentially disruptive technologies that could help address some of the governance issues and improve some transparency concerns because um, that's Mr. Biddle. Is exactly right, right? We all know from having worked in the field that uh, there are some ex there are some bad actors in the field, and it can be very difficult to shift the incentives of folks in the public sector. So, how can technology help shift some of those incentives? And then maybe as well, another way to shift incentives is to look at what's happening at the international and regional levels around legal requirements related to business and human rights. And so how does the business and human rights agenda, which has been largely dissociated from the land agenda, how does that agenda, which now has new reporting requirements for large European companies to report on their actions related to land and other rights, how does that also help address the governance and the transparency concerns? Thank you. And it was a really nice panel. Anyone over here? Lisa Dickerson from Comonix, and actually um, the question that was just posed is actually very similar to what I was going to raise, the issue of technology and how that can help to increase transparency and be used in an effective manner. And um, I'm interested too in, in particularly, I mean, I have seen examples of where technology has been used to increase information that's out there about land holdings and what's being done with the land. I'm familiar with the project in Cambodia working on that. But how can we ensure that the technology and the information that gets out there through it is utilized effectively by the citizens? Because I think so many times um, we're getting the information out there and the citizens aren't able to really marshal that information and utilize it in an effective manner. And also um, interested in any examples, kind of following up on the previous question there, of where um, technology has been a negative in this. Um, and sometimes I, you know, you see these examples where you sort of feel like the do no harm uh, uh, principle should be invoked. So curious about that. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to give the, the panel a so please uh, fire away. Let's take the take the first. Go ahead. <laughs> That's all right. Well, these are very um, good questions and very challenging questions. I will try to answer in two ways. I, I think uh, looking at the governance question, I think that's really key. And the question is not about saying that the local is good or the global is bad or the government is bad or good. So the question of good and bad is not here the issue. I think what we need to think about is um, what are the practices or what are the, like, um, sanction mechanisms that we can put in place to make sure that we can 
uh, hold government officials, for example, accountable, and even the local elites. Because when we talk about land grab, we always think about foreign investors. But if you go to the fields in many countries, the local elites are really the one grabbing the land of the local communities because they have money, they have power, and nobody can really uh, hold them accountable. So what are the sanctions mechanism that we can put in place? I think that's something we need to uh, think about. And when it comes to technology and, I will t um, and in relation to land, and here I will use uh, again the case of Africa that I know very much. So what we're seeing, for example, in uh, Central Africa, there are two trends when it comes to land administration. For example, the government will use uh, zoning and while doing zoning, they use high tech and just try to map all the lands from a distance and, and they have a big picture of where the lands are. And like I said at the beginning, they might know where the land and the resources are by doing that, but they might not know where the people are and what are the rights of those people uh, regarding uh, those land and resources. So what, the, for example, the civil society and most of the advocates for uh, right, what they, they um, pushing for is to say, okay, instead of doing zoning, why don't you do co participatory community rights mapping? It's another way of doing technology, but not maybe technology as modern as we're seeing it, but at least it will help capture the rights of the people, where their rights are, the resources, and they can be the one even saying, this is where my territory starts and this is where it ends. These are the resources I use and this is how I use them. So again, here the issue of technology is very relative and it depends on what it helps ca to, to capture. If it helps really capture the rights aspect, that's fine, but it's only the resources to help the government see, okay, these are the resources that I have available. And sometimes you might not, by, by doing these like uh, GIS, you might not see where the people are. And you go there at the in the field, you find out that there are even people living in those areas. And how do you do, uh, deal with that? So again, the question of technology is very tricky here when it comes to uh, land administration. It depends on who's talking and from uh, what perspective. Yeah. And Mike or Kiernan, would you like to? Um, just, to just to build on that point, I think there's um, some really interesting applications of, of very cheap available uh, mapping technology, just basically Google Maps, um, Open Map, other, other kind of software programs that can be combined with community mapping uh, mechanisms um, to kind of use technology as a low cost way to, to look at, at land administration and ownership. Um, but I think all technology application, you know, need to be taken with a grain of salt. Um, you always have to make sure you're not uh, using technology as a solution to everything <laughs> and um, considering the potential uh, detriments. Um, I, think, I think one of the, the problems in the past with technology, um, and maybe still sometimes, is, is kind of over-technifying certain um, institutions, government institutions or um, agencies that maybe aren't, in, aren't going to be able to continue to implement certain technological solutions in a sustainable way. I'm um, kind of over-technifying. Um, I think that's sometimes been a fault um, of, of, of development projects. Um, I can touch briefly as well on the, on the first um, issue of, of corruption and, and the judiciary. I mean, I think generally what are, what are the incentives for any government agency to be fair and not corrupt? Um, I mean, community participation, involvement. Um, monitoring, watchdogging, you know, there's, there's, I think that's always an incentive that's involved. I think actually you can kind of turn it on its head um, when you strengthen land rights and give people uh, recognition of their rights to their land, they will be more engaged in its administration. They'll be more engaged in um, the taxation and the use of those funds that come from their property. Generally, once people feel they have a right in their land and it's a right that's been recognized by law, they will engage with the agencies that are that surround its use and the government institutions, particularly at the local level. Um, but where that still doesn't work, I think this is where it's important to link it to dispute resolution processes and to the judiciary. Um, I think with land, one thing that's extremely important is having some type of administrative, more streamlined, but administrative, easy, easily accessible uh, dispute resolution body that you can go to and say, you know, this surveyor was bribed and, and took away my land or you know, this was this was measured wrong or something like that. Um, I think in terms of the judiciary, it's it's obviously it's you know the judiciary is an extremely important branch of the government, essential part of the government, and it's a, a, an institution that I think we've 
struggle as development practitioners to support effectively. Um, I think for land specifically, it's, it's, it's worth looking at administrative dispute resolution processes that are then appealable to the judiciary and that then of course they're linked you know, to judicial reform that improve the transparency, improve the effectiveness um, of the judiciary so they can process what is oftentimes a large number of cases. Um, I think we've seen with the you know, restitution process in Colombia, land restitution process in Colombia that's going on right now that courts, the judiciary are sometimes a little too cumbersome to effectively uh, deal with a large number of disputes, a large number of cases and administrative processes are, are more effective. Um, more streamlined, um, but that there has to be an appeal to the judiciary for cases. Um, I think that's all I'll, I'll touch on. It wasn't very long ago that there was a bias against working with government. Uh, we preferred instead to work with civil society, and if one did work with government, one tended to work somewhere down the food chain, down the municipal levels, local government levels. And that has taken a rapid, rapid turn in the last couple of years. And I think the good thing about that is that, you know, if you want to have change, it's easier to make change from within than, than from outside. It's, hold, it's hard to hold any government agency's feet to the fire. We rarely appreciate all the numerous constraints that any minister in Africa or Latin America faces. And by being on the inside, we gain an understanding of those constraints, but also working side by side, we can also work on solutions, and, and that's good. There's also been a fundamental shift in that it used to be, just not very many years back, Democracy and governance programs were standalone with a heavy <coughs> emphasis on capacity building. We increasingly see governance uh, components now built into land uh, programs where we are working as hand in hand, you know, capacity building, experiential learning, whatever you want to call it, mentoring, with, um, with, uh, with government colleagues to try to improve the productivity of, of their systems and the efficiency by which they operate. So, uh, I think those are big changes, but I still think we're new in the game. On the issue of technology, I feel a little bit like a seat this morning. Um, it's not exactly my forte. My, my youngest daughter can do more with a cell phone and a laptop than I can do and probably won't ever do. Uh, but I, I will say I am nervous about cloud-based com uh, computing. Uh, I'm always nervous about who controls the reservoir of data how it's used, who has access to it. Because if we've learned anything in the last 15 to 20 years, it's that someone who's always a little bit wealthier, a little bit more influential, a little bit at the, who has a little bit more stake in the game, or has an interest to succeed, always seems to have preferred access to information. And in turn, then how do you open up information in ways that served before? And I think that there have been know, um, interesting developments in cell phone technology. We've also simplified our standards, uh, at least in land surveying. We don't use uh, toll to point station, uh, at least in rural areas anymore. We've shifted to general boundary approaches. We rely on uh, community mechanisms to uh, adjudicate rights and to defend those rights. We tend to lessen, lessen the data demands. Um, but I am fundamentally nervous about where technology is going if we cannot ha say at the end of the day who's going to ha have access to that repository of data and to assure effectively good governance over that. Um, some of you out there may feel that that exists now. I don't think it does. And uh, until it does, I think we need to be very, very careful about who has access to information because the smallholder that is registered today, the wife who uh, acquires that first piece of land finds that uh, she is at the top of someone's list who wants to move in and establish a flower farm and displace him or her property. That's a fundamental concern. Thank you, thanks to each of you. Uh, we have 10 minutes, so we have time for uh, another round of questions. And if you prefer to ask them to a particular person, please make that uh, indicate that. Yes. Colleen Soto with Conservation International Center for Environment and Peace. 
And it, it's not lost on me that um, almost every country where we work has been mentioned in this panel. Um, and also that we're a kind of, call it a new actor in this space, even though these themes are very relevant to our work. And uh, Tiara, you specifically called out kind of technical expertise that's required to address issues around land in, in, a, in this new and evolving space. And I was just wondering if the panelists could just kind of touch on who they think are sort of some of the actors who have had a, a smaller role and then may potentially be able to kind of contribute to this evolving direction as well as then what are the kind of new areas of ex expertise that as uh, NGOs we should be thinking about, you know, what, what are we bringing to the table as sort of our, our different areas of application and, and skills to contribute? Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Joan Dubik. I work at ITGW. I'm going to ask a question just to put it out on the table, but I have to confess I'm not the expert on this. At s land tenure in all my career at USAID was an issue in almost every country we worked in. Mm -hmm. And at some point in the 80s, one of the things that we were talking about in Central America was how do you, if you do any kind of land reform, how do you prevent people from being, being intimidated? I mean, you can give them title, but they may be intimidated to selling, into selling to one of these elites. And so, Michael, I was just wondering, one of the solutions that was proposed at that time was um, not allowing people to sell their land for a certain number of years um, so that they were, I mean, there's an enforcement problem, but I, I'm just sort of asking to be brought up a little bit to date if you have heard of that kind of a procedure and whether it has had any impact. Thank you. Uh, any others? Or? Okay. Uh, get in Michael. Yes, Michael. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the second question, I mean, I can talk a bit about that as, as can Michael. Um, I mean, actually in Colombia right now, there's a prohibition on, on selling land that's been restituted for two years. Um, I think it's uh, people actually questioning that policy. Um, whether it's something that makes sense considering a lot of people don't actually want to return to their land. Um, they're being restituted. Mm -hmm. So so what they end up doing is informally selling it, which then continues the whole pattern and, and the culture of, of informal title holding. And then if there's some dispute, they can't actually resolve that dispute legally. Um, so I think people are questioning whether that's something that actually should, should be in the law. But it is. So it is being used partially because I think of those power dynamics. The issue being that the land will just be sold right out from underneath them as soon as it's returned to them. Um, I know less about, about its application in Central America, except for I know that, I mean, one thing when talking about this that we didn't really mention is, is the dynamic, particularly in Latin America, between land reform and land rights. Mm -hmm. uh, land reform is a, is a, is a sensitive, uh, sensitive topic, particularly in Latin America, where it's associated a lot with redis redistributive policies, um, where land was taken from elites, basically, oftentimes with some type of, uh, you know, socialist rhetoric or something and, and, and given to the poor oftentimes in collective farms. And that, that's the land reform that's characterized Latin America in the 80s and 70s mm -hmm. and, and I think even prior. Um, and a lot of that didn't work for a lot of reasons. I think what we are talking about more is, 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 is collective and individual rights, um, but still within a common market system. Um, so, it's, so saying land reform can be tricky and particularly when you look back in the Latin America examples from before. Um, I'll, I'll let the rest of you deal with those issues for <laughs> now. Um, in terms of other actors that have an increased role in, in land, um, I think it's, I think what I was mentioning, what I was talking about was, was really having people with different, from dis different dis disciplines focus on land specifically. So having lawyers, um, judges, people from the government looking at land, how do you resolve land disputes? Um, land administration, how do you effectively administer land, uh, cadaster experts, how do you effectively run a cadaster, surveyors, I think surveyors, particularly in a lot of developing countries, is a profession that's underdeveloped, um, requires a lot of investment. Um, all these different groups, and then of course the, the tech, the whole tech side, uh, programmers, uh, people who know how to work with GIS, who know how to use new technology, and disruptive technology um, that's cheap and available. Um, so have bringing all those groups together, all those those technical experts together, I think is how you would improve uh, on 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 land focuses. Um, 
So I think NGOs and international development firms uh, should look at, you know, who are, who are your experts? Who do you have and can they adapt their skill set to look at land issues specifically? I want to try to be provocative here a little bit on the NGO issues, maybe to stir up some lunchtime conversation. <laughs> um, you know, who are the clientele of NGOs? They're ultimately the beneficiaries, their communities, their populations. Um, they may not have worked at a level of policy and law and uh, technology that we deal with. But I'd like to just turn it in on, on its head a bit. And that is, it used to be that USAID invested heavily in NGO for their advocacy and for their watchdog to be able to give voice to communities that are underserved. And the big question I will throw out there is, who is holding us accountable? You want to talk about the voluntary guidelines, who's implementing those? It's not communities. It's, it's multilateral, bilateral, uh, high, highest levels of government. Global tools networks that are being uh, operated by the UN and the World Bank and endorsed and promoted, who is holding them accountable? And I would suggest that if at the end of the day, if populations around the world don't have a say in how these technologies and frameworks evolved, and submit them to constructive criticism, then there's a fundamental problem. And that's the role that has to play. Now, in every project we have, or Tiernan has, or, or do you have projects? <laughs> or <No>. you have? <laughs> uh, we always have our partners. Mm -hmm. But the role of those partners is going to have to fundamentally shift. And to me, that's a, a looking up and holding this vast land apparatus and this vast land governance apparatus um, to what it says it will do. The second thing, not allowing people to sell. You know, this has been a debate in Africa for a long time, and um, people are concerned about giving up their assets for the long term and removing the, the ability of their children to inherit those assets. For many African cultures, land is the asset that they have. The house is the asset that they have. And the risk of selling that land off and moving to a city and not gaining a job for its future generation is greatly at risk. But you have to raise the question, why not a land rental? Why not a land rental? And the question that comes up then is who is going to be the authority that gives credence to a contract, a land rental contract? If governments are weak, if governments are corrupt, if we, uh, governments are biased, or there is the absence of government due to a weak state. Who is to provide the ultimate authority to give credence to a contract? And the same then is true in Latin America. Uh, I can understand that why you'd want to uh, lock people in on the land asset. Well, you can say they're, they're ignorant, for lack of a better word. They don't have the resources. Uh, so you want to put them on the land to make sure that they are going to uh, meet the livelihood goals of the development program. But what if you really knew that 10 years down the road you're locking people into poverty? Because for whatever reasons, governments and markets do not provide the livelihoods or the inputs that improve their livelihoods in a poverty sense. And the world is full of secure property rights and land locked in, or people locked into land but not having the wherewithal to improve their lot in life. And so you then have to think about what mechanisms you can use in a land leasing context. If a large investor comes into an indigenous community, why does there have to be a permanent transaction? Why can't there be a 30-year lease, a 50-year lease that allows the establishment of a sawmill or an equal tourism agency and a contract carefully negotiated? All of that is possible, but who at the end of the day is the authority that gives that contract credence, that makes the investor feel that their assets and their investment are protected and that the community's rights are protected? Now, the global community of us donors may feel that we're going to do that. We're going to step in and we're going to provide that authority and help governments, help governments do that. Well, that's a big task. And if we want to do it, that's great. I think that's the way forward. But we also have to own up to the bigness and the largeness and the financial commitments to make that happen. And I'm not seeing it so far. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Solange, Tiernan, for your uh, 
commentary, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, it's 12.30 now, so thanks again, and one final round of applause for the panelists.